know Jesus Christ as Savior, Jews and Gentiles together, when we trust in Christ, we're placed in what's called the body of Christ or the church. In this passage, we actually see the beginning of that. It is the bringing together the believers, placing them in Christ, and beginning this, what we call the church. Now, as we look at this this morning, two things are going to stand out. We're going to see two things. First, we're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, the Holy Spirit is just almost ignored. uh, And we'll talk exactly what does the Holy Spirit do. And then, we'll see the beginning of the church. So there's a lot there. As we begin, let me raise some questions for you to think about, okay? Number, what is the day of Pentecost? I mean, what, what does Pentecost mean? It actually means 50, so we'll talk about that. Then what is the role of the Holy Spirit? And then what, what he did, at, what did he do at Pentecost? And then how was the church formed? And what is the speaking in tongues that we see that they're speaking in languages here? What is that? And, and how does that compare even to today and tell, talk about people say speaking in tongues and those things how does all that fit well there's so much we'll see it as we go through our passage when we think about God I mean the truth is it's it's uh, it's he's hard to comprehend when you think about it. I mean he's amazing there's one God in three persons and you say God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit and you think about it, you say okay I think about God I think of him as my Heavenly Father and I say I pray dear Heavenly Father and so I think of God as the Father I also think of Jesus Christ as the Son, and I realize He's the Son of God who left the glories of heaven, came to the earth, died on the cross, paid for sin, and rose again. So I see the Father and the Son. But then when we start saying the Holy Spirit, we say things like, okay, the Holy Spirit. What exactly does the Holy Spirit do? And sometimes the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not only overlooked, but misunderstood. And so as we look in Acts chapter 2 this morning, we're going to see the Holy Spirit coming to indwell believers, to fill believers for power, to form what we call the church, the body of Christ. And, and there's so much there. And so what we're going to do this morning, three things. First of all, we'll review what we saw. I'll just kind of go over Acts chapter 1 just to make sure we all know where we are. Then we'll see the day of Pentecost and the role of the Holy Spirit. And then we'll see the forming of the church, how the church is formed. It all happens at the same time. We'll be responsible by the people what has happened. And so let's begin just with a, a brief review. We realize that Luke is giving this, this uh, uh, what we might call a concise history. He's talking about the first 30 years of what we'd call the church, the body of Christ. He's right, writing to a man named Theophilus. Man's name means lover of God a friend of God and so he's writing to his friend and saying listen what Jesus started now is being carried on is through the power of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and that's basically what he's talking about it's the spread of the message of Jesus Christ beginning in Jerusalem going through Judea and Samaria and then through the rest of the world and that's powerful we'll see some great people like Peter and then we'll see this guy named Stephen and and, and Philip and then we'll see Paul he'll come into this a, a little bit later on so there's a lot there in chapter 1 when we got some of the background there we saw two things sort of stood out one is the ministry of Jesus Christ for these 40 days after his death and resurrection Jesus died on the cross paid for sin rose again three days later and then walked on the earth for 40 days in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 it says that he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days speaking of the things pertaining the kingdom of God he taught them about the kingdom and he gave them their message and their their ministry their ministry is to be witnesses of him in fact verse 8 says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon me you'll be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the most parts of the earth now that was the first thing we saw the second thing we saw is after Jesus ascended into heaven we saw the believers choosing the twelfth apostle to take the place of Judas that was the last part of chapter 1 and there's all kind of debates on whether they should have picked somebody or not the best we can tell that's exactly what was supposed to happen and so they picked a man by the name of Thais and he was the 12th apostle as we continue we find that the believers are doing what God told them to do Jesus said go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise the promise is the Holy Spirit to come and so they've gone back to Jerusalem. They've been in, in an upper room. We don't know if it's the same place that Jesus had the, what we call the Last Supper or not, but it's an upper room. And we find that even today, there's about 120 people meeting together on a regular basis. And what they're doing is they're in unity and they're praying and they're doing all those things. In fact, listen to this. This is chapter 1, verse 14. They were all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers, and also there's about 120 of them meeting together and if you said to them what are y'all here for they said we're waiting until we get the promise of the Holy Spirit Jesus told us to go back to Jerusalem and wait till the Spirit came when the Spirit comes then we're supposed to go and begin telling people about Jesus in Jerusalem Judea Samaria to the rest of the world 
In fact, as we start chapter 2, let me show you the outline of what we're going to look at this morning. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is the day of Pentecost. Now, that's a unique day. People talk about it all the time. It, the Holy Spirit came. You hear people called Pentecostals because Pentecostals emphasize the Holy Spirit. And so that's why they're called Pentecostals because it goes back to this Feast of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming. We see the coming of the Holy Spirit. They see they're filled by the Holy Spirit. We see the reaction by the people. It's going to be an amazing thing. People are going to come from all over. They're going to all gather together. We see it's people from all nations, and we see the statements that are made. And so we'll see it as we go through. Well, let's begin. We're in Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Well, well, here's the day of Pentecost. Now, we raise the question, what is the day of Pentecost? It's a Jewish feast. In fact, you may not realize this, but last Wednesday, last Wednesday was Pentecost on the Jewish calendar. Now, what we find is this, that it was one of the feasts that the Jewish people celebrated every year. In Leviticus 23, God gave to them at least seven different yearly feasts. There's more than that, but he gave them seven in Leviticus 23. The 14th day of the first month is Passover. Then they had a feast called Unleavened Bread. Then they had a feast called First Fruits. From First Fruits, they counted 50 days, and it was called Pentecost. And this is a, a, a special one because Jewish men... Every Jewish man was required under the Mosaic law to come to Jerusalem three times a year. One of those times was Pentecost. So the, the city is going to be filled with people because all Jewish men know, well, it's Pentecost. We're supposed to go there, and they go there. And at this feast, the Jews would do this. They, they would offer sacrifices, and they would take two loaves of bread. And they would, the priest would hold up these two loaves of bread and offer them to God. Now, they didn't know exactly what they were for. In fact, the Jewish celebration was remembering that they believed that Moses got the law on this day. But what we realize, it wasn't anything to do with the law. It has to do with the church. Because those two loaves, even though they didn't realize it, those two loaves represent Jews and Gentiles who come together in one body. And we'll see that as we go through it. This fulfills the promise. Now, as we look at this, we're going to see the promise that the church is going to begin. Let me show you. We have that chart. This is the chart we've been using. It's a little bit different than the one we've been using in Sunday school. But you see the Old Testament out to the, the far side over there. And then here's Jesus, and he comes to the earth. He dies on the cross, paid for sin, rises again, walks on the earth for 40 days, and then goes back to heaven. That, that uh, era thing is the death and resurrection of Christ. He's gone back to the heavens. In Acts chapter 2 is when the church began. The reason we put it in parenthesis in this passage or in this chart is to show you that from the Old Testament, they never heard of the church. There's no such thing. The first mention of the church is found in Matthew when Jesus said, I will build my church. I bet you those guys went, what's he talking about? Because they had never heard of the church. And so we find that the church is, was a mystery in the Old Testament, and this is what is forming in Acts chapter 2, and this is us. All of us in this room, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, you're part of the church, the body of Christ. You're placed in Christ and connected with Him, and that's the church. Now, the next event, and we've been doing this in Sunday school. If you'd like to get a lot more details, come to Sunday school. We're doing end-time events. The next event will be the rapture in which the church will be taken off the face of the earth. We call that the rapture. We're gone. There'll be a time period after that called the tribulation. It'll last for seven years. Then the second coming of Christ to the earth, and He sets up a kingdom after that. And there's a lot more details, but on this chart, I just wanted you to see where the church fits in and that's us it's we're here for a temporary time we're not we're not jewish people we're not the old testament we're the body of christ made up of jews and gentiles together we're going to see this in acts chapter 2 so it says when the day of pentecost had come they were all together in one place some people say that they're probably in the upper room no telling where they were but they're all together and look what happened and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, I want you to read it carefully. It didn't say a rushing wind came through that house. There was no wind. It said there came a noise from heaven like a violent rushing wind. There wasn't wind in the house. It was the noise of if a wind comes. And maybe sometimes you've heard the wind and you go, wow, that's making some noise. Or maybe like a tornado or something, you hear that roar of the, the sound. Well, all of a sudden, while these people are praying, waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit, suddenly... The, the, there's this noise that fills the whole room and, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And uh, they don't know what's happening. 
uh, sometimes you've seen movies, and in the movies a wind comes through and everybody's hair is blowing and everything. There wasn't a wind. It says it was like a violent wind. It wasn't a wind. And look what happened. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and resting on each one of them. Now, the tongues of fire were basically as flames of fire above their heads. Here were these people in a room, and I suddenly heard this noise. And then they looked up, and it was like fire, flames of fire. They call them tongues of fire. And above everybody's head was a flame. All, all the people around the room, they looked around, and they went, I hope I have a flame. Everybody else has got a flame, right? I mean, that's what they're saying. Everybody, there were these flames above the people's heads. It says they rested on each one. Now, what is this? It's actually, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God. It's God giving them a visual of what's happening because the Holy Spirit is coming upon them. And we're going to see that the Holy Spirit's going to go inside them. The Holy Spirit's going to fill them with power. The Holy Spirit's going to place them all in the body. And so uh, we're, we're going to see how this works. But it, it, it seemed as in that room, they looked around and they heard this noise and they saw these flames above everybody's heads. And it says it appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves. They rested on each one of them. This is the fulfillment of the coming of the Holy Spirit. You remember Jesus had told them. He said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you by yourselves. There's going to come a time in which the Holy Spirit will come. And he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. And then as he got ready to leave, he told them, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. This is the promise. Now, what about us? We say, well, what about us? What about when somebody trusts Jesus Christ today? The moment they trust Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them, and the Holy Spirit places them in Christ. So it's not something we have to wait for anymore. When a person believes from, that, from this point on in the Bible, from this point on, the moment they believe, uh, the Holy Spirit comes. And we'll talk, there's, there's a couple of sections, and I'm going to show it to you as we go through the book of Acts. But this is what happens now. Now, look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues, other languages is really what it says, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, we're going to find that they were filled, and filling is always for service. This is for ministry, okay? The Holy Spirit coming to live inside of them is different than the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explain it more in just a second. But here they are in this room, flames above their heads. They're all, there's noise, and then suddenly... They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak, and it says, with other tongues, with other languages. The, the, Hebrew, the Greek word is glossoleo, which means a, a voice, a language. It could be used for, original, for a real tongue, like if you said, there's your tongue, glossoleo, but you could also say, what's your tongue? What's your language? What do you speak? And so all of a sudden, they begin to speak different languages. It says, they were fixed as, the, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, let's just pretend that happened this second. All of a sudden, each one of us in the room, we could speak languages we didn't know. Suddenly, I just start speaking Spanish really good, or, or maybe German, or Russian, or who knows what. And you might be speaking. They were all speaking these languages. Now, by the way, we're going to see a listing of the places that, these, that the languages they spoke. We'll see them in verses 9, 10, and 11. Because it goes on to tell us where they were speaking these languages. And people were going, whoa, I can hear them. The gift of tongues is the ability to speak a language that you have not studied or mastered in any way. If I had the gift of tongues, suddenly I could speak a language that I don't know. And the role, the whole purpose of the gift of tongues was to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ in a language you do not know. We'll talk more about it later. Uh, what some people talk about today is the gift of tongues and where people say things that nobody knows what they're saying. Uh, that's not the biblical gift of tongues. And we'll talk more about that at another time. But what we see here is they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. We're going to actually see in verses 9, 10, and 11, he lists the places that people said, I hear him speak in my language. I'm from Egypt. I'm from Cyrene. I'm from Cretia. Uh, uh, you know, I'm an Arab. I'm, I'm, I'm an Elamite. I'm from Judea. I'm from Cappadocia. I'm from Mesopotamia. I'm a Parthian. I'm a Mede. They were hearing them speak their language. In fact, I'm going to show you in just a second. He, they not only heard their language, they heard their dialects. If I'd have been there, I would have heard him speak in Southern, right? <laughs> it's their dialect. The word is dialectus. It doesn't just mean you heard them speak English. You heard them speak where they were from. It was their particular dialect. And they'd go, 
This person's not from my hometown. He's not from where I live. He's not from where I grew up. How can he say those things? That's what it's all about. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit was giving others. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, we're going to stop for a second because we want to talk about something, but this noise was heard everywhere. And all of a sudden, they're beginning to just shout out truths about Jesus Christ in all these different languages. Well, people from all over the world are there, and they hear it. And they all come together. And people all come together and, and the apostles and these guys come out and they begin to speak in languages to these people. And they can hear them and they can understand them. And the guy says, he's speaking in my language. I hear what he's saying. The other guy over here speaks a different language. He says, I hear this guy speaking in my language. And the people all come together. And we're going to see what happens in just a minute. But I want you to understand what's going on. And there's two things I want us to see. Okay. I want us to see the coming of the Spirit. I want you to understand what the Holy Spirit does, the role and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to see the formation of the church. That all happens right here. Let's start first with the coming of the Holy Spirit, okay? And, and what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, first of all, who is the Holy Spirit? Sometimes people say, well, God, God's the Father. Jesus Christ is the Son. The Holy Spirit's an it. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit's a person. He's a member of the Godhead. He's God. In fact, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 said that the Holy Spirit is God. He is the Creator. In fact, every attribute you could name of Jesus or the Father is the same of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus calls him the paraclete. Paraclete. Para means beside. Kalete means to be called. It means the one who is called beside the help. He's our helper. The Holy Spirit empowers us. He's our comforter. He comes alongside to help. Now, here's what I want to do. And, and if you really want a lot of detail, I've done studies in the past. And you can go on the online and get the, get the audio stuff uh, of a uh, whole study on the role of the Holy Spirit. But what I want to do this morning is just quickly show you two things. I want you to show the role of the Holy Spirit to an unbeliever. What does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the unbeliever what does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the believer let's start with the unbeliever and I'm going to read this to you you don't have to turn there if you don't want to it's John chapter 16 verses 7 through 11 where Jesus actually explained what happens what does the Holy Spirit do he convicts the world listen to this I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking. Tell you the truth, it's your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come. That's the Holy Spirit. If I go, I'll send him. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, listen to what he says. He will convict the world of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. The world is the Greek word cosmos. It is always and only used for the unbeliever. It says when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the unbeliever of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. It doesn't say he will convict the world of sins. It's not personal sins that the Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever of. It is this. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. The Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers that they have not believed in Jesus Christ. It is not personal sins. It is not you need to stop this, stop this, stop this. The Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever that they have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Sin the next one is righteousness. It, it, he says righteousness to, to be with the Father. He says you have to be righteous to be with the Father. And then the Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment that there's a judgment coming. So to an unbeliever, when the Holy Spirit convicts them, he convicts them that they have not believed in Christ, that they are not righteous, and that there's a judgment coming. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Now, let me tell you something. That means when you talk to an unbeliever, when you're sharing your faith and the Holy Spirit's convicting them, don't get on all these issues. You stay on one issue, and that is, will they believe in Jesus Christ as Savior? Because the Holy Spirit is convicting them that they have not believed in Christ. So don't get off on whether Jonah was in by, by fish and how many days were the creation. Was there an Ezekiel and all those kind of things. Stay on the issue that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that he died and rose again, and if you believe in him, you have eternal life. That's the issue. So the Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers that they need to believe in Jesus Christ. That's the plan. Okay, well, what about us? What about believers? 
Okay, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit does two things. One, he does certain things the moment we are saved, and then he does things in our Christian lives. Now, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but let me show you what the Holy Spirit does at the moment of salvation. The moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, here's what the Holy Spirit did for you. First of all, he regenerated you. John chapter 3, verse 5 says you must be what? Born again. Regeneration. You are dead, spiritually dead. You come into this world dead in trespasses and sins. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, He makes you spiritually alive. You're spiritually dead. And now we're spiritually alive. In Ephesians 2, uh, He said, We who were dead in our trespasses and sins, He has made us alive alive. That means when you're talking to an unbeliever, they're spiritually dead. They're not going to be able to understand the things about God until the Holy Spirit convicts them. Okay? So, you are spiritually dead. The moment you trust in Christ, He makes you alive. We call that being born again. Okay? Or born from above. It's called regeneration. Happens the moment you believe in Christ. Second, he comes to live inside of us. Romans 8 9 says, If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a child of God. 1 Corinthians 6 19 says, What do you not know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. The moment you trust, or the moment a person trusts in Christ, God the Holy Spirit actually comes to live inside of them. That happened on the day of Pentecost. All those flames above, it was really showing them what was about to happen, and the Holy Spirit was going to come in there. Uh, listen to this. Jesus said this in John 14. He said, the, the Spirit of the truth is coming. You know Him because He abides with you, but He will be in you. What is so unique about the church is throughout history, from Adam and Eve to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, to David, to all of those people, they did not have the Holy Spirit permanently living in them. In the church age, our age, when, when, when you trust, when a person trusts in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live permanently in us. It's called the indwelling of the Spirit. There's a third thing the Holy Spirit does. The moment you believe, He seals you. Ephesians 1 says you're sealed until the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 says that. That means that He makes you secure. The moment you believe in Christ, you are saved and you're saved forever and the Holy Spirit keeps you saved. He seals you until the day of redemption. And the Bible tells us that He gives to us eternal life and will never perish and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now here's the fourth one. Fourth one is he baptizes us. Now, people get confused about that because when we think of baptism, first of all, we think of water baptism because that's a ritual. This is the Spirit baptizing. And a lot of people, when you, I say baptism of the Holy Spirit, you all think of things that you've heard in your life about maybe the Holy Spirit coming upon somebody and they're talking in tongues or they're doing something. That's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit places you in Christ. That's the forming of the church. Every time a person believes in Jesus Christ as Savior, he places that person in union with Jesus Christ. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 actually says that. So it's very, very powerful truth. Do not be confused. It has nothing to do with speaking in tongues. It has none of that. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is when we're in union with Christ. The last one is that he gives us spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says that the Spirit gives gifts as he will. Every believer, every one of us in this room, you have at least one spiritual gift. And you get that the moment you believe in Christ. So, the moment you believe in Christ, He regenerates you, He comes to live in you, He seals you, He places you in Christ, and He gives you spiritual gifts. That happens just like that. And it's not something you ask for. You don't say, oh, please give me a gift. He's already did it. You don't say, oh, please put me in Christ. He's already done it. You don't have to say, oh, Holy Spirit, come live in me. He's already there. So, the moment you believe, all of this happens. Now, daily, there's a number of things that He does, but I just want you to see two. Okay, we'll go to it here in a second. There, in the Christian life daily, 
He fills us. Now, that's what's happening in the book of Acts. I'm going to go back over there. But in Acts chapter 2, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the power to serve God. He fills us. Now, that doesn't happen automatically. That's why the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. That means you live in such a way that the power of the Holy Spirit comes through you. You live in obedience, and God's power comes through you. It's the same as walking in the Spirit. Galatians says, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he fills us, and he fills us on an ongoing basis. Now let me tell you, if you've got sin in your life, you're not filled with the Spirit. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit, and you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit to serve God. Okay? The second thing that he does, and there's so much more, but I just want to put these two. He illuminates the Scripture. In other words, he helps you as you study the Bible to understand it. Listen to this. Jesus says, I got a lot of things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, and he will disclose it to you. As you study the Bible, as you dig it, as you study it, the Holy Spirit helps you to understand it and put it together. Now, there's other things that he does daily. I just picked these two out. Okay, so what have we seen? That when, when you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, immediately, first of all, the Holy Spirit convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You put your faith in Christ. The moment you put your faith in Christ, He regenerated you. He came to live inside of you. He, he sealed you. He put you in Christ, and He gave you spiritual gifts. And then every day, you can be filled with the Spirit, and He illuminates the Scripture. Okay, that is the ministry of the Spirit. Now, on the day of Pentecost, not only did that happen to these believers, but there was something unique happened because they're placed in Christ. There's the beginning of what we call the church. And that's the second thing here I wanted you to see. The formation of the church. This is, and go to the next slide. This is the baptizing, being, place, placing the believers into union with Jesus Christ is the forming of the church. And from that day on, Whenever a person believes in Christ, they are placed in Christ. Most of you know 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You're in Christ because you're in the body of Christ. My prayer is this, that every one of you in this room, that you have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. When you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, all those things happen to you the moment you believed, and you are in Christ, and you're part of the church, the body of Christ. And as you go through life, there's the power of the Holy Spirit to, to, that you can be filled with so you can serve God. That is the key. So this is the fulfillment of Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus said, I will build my church. You are the church. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. The church is not a building. Obviously, that's true because we don't have a building, right? The church is not an event. Did y'all have church today? Church is not an event. The church are the people. The church are the believers who've been placed in union with Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And so this is the fulfillment there. It's, it's an amazing thing. So in reality, there is the filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and, and the empowering of the Holy Spirit to the people on that day. And the church is, being, is formed right here. Now, what are they doing? They hear this noise. They begin to speak these other languages. They're proclaiming the truth. Why, why would God give them the ability to speak a bunch of different languages on this particular day? Because in Jerusalem... From all over the world, Jewish people have come for the Feast of Pentecost. They're from all over the world. They speak all different languages. They've all come together, and suddenly they're going to hear the message of Christ in their own language from these people. Watch what happens. Verse 5. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When it says living in Jerusalem, it doesn't mean they were living there permanently. It means they came there for the Feast of Pentecost. And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, it says when this sound was heard. Now, here's the question. What sound? The sound of the noise that sounded like wind or the sound of them proclaiming these messages? It could be both. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. It says the sound occurred. The crowd came together. Everybody began to come together and say, what's going on? Everybody got over there, and all of a sudden, they're all meeting to hear. By the way, there are thousands of people here. It's not, it's not 100 people here. There's going to be thousands of people here because when this thing is over with, 3,000 people trust Christ right then. Okay? 3,000. 
So there's a whole bunch of people there, and they're hearing them. And look what it says in verse 7. And this, but this is going on, and, and we don't know exactly what's happening. But no, oh, by the way, I've got to go back to the end of verse 6. Each one of them was hearing them speak in his own what? What does it say? Language. It's the word dialect. It doesn't just mean language like I heard it in English. I heard it in Southern English, right? You heard the dialect. And so they were amazed and they were astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They said, Listen, we know these people. We know them. They're not from around here. They're from Galilee. They're from the northern part of Israel. How can this person speak my personal language? How can they do that? And watch. How is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? This was a shocking thing to them. And then they go ahead and list them. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia and Phylegria and Pamphylia and Egypt and districts of, Cy of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Christians, Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue, our own language. Notice what they hear. Speaking of the mighty deeds of God. So all these people have gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and God allows these believers to give out a message in their languages. So when people start talking about gift of tongues, it's not all the stuff that a lot of people use it for today. It is the ability to speak a language you don't know to proclaim the wonderful works of God. And you got the gift of tongues, find out what language it is, and then go to that place and tell them about Jesus. Because that's what it's for. It was also, and we'll find it in another place, and it's a sign to the Jewish people. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It was a sign to the Jewish people they had lost their responsibility to proclaim Christ. Because now the church is going to do it. That's what happened on this day. Look what it says again. The wonderful, I think the next line, the wonderful deeds of God. It was the greatness of God. Now look at verse 12. They all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying one to another, What does this mean? But watch, just like, just like when something happens and people don't understand it, they make fun of it. So some of the people said this, but others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. They said, these people are drunk. Whatever you're hearing, we don't, we don't understand all this, but all that stuff that we're hearing and these languages and things, we know these guys are from Galilee. How can they talk? They're just drunk. That's what they really said. And then we're going to find next week that Peter stands up he says, excuse me, can I have your attention? I want you to understand, first of all, we're not drunk. It's just 9 o'clock in the morning, okay? He says, this is what Joel talked about in Joel chapter 2. And he begins to quote Joel 2, and he talks about Jesus, and he talks about Jesus dying and rising again, and he talks about David, and he quotes David, and he tells who Jesus is. And guess what? At the end of Peter's message, they say, whoa, we killed the Messiah. What should we do? And he tells them. And we'll see that in a couple of weeks. Let's make some application. What have we seen this morning? We've seen the coming of Pentecost and the forming of the church. And we've seen the believers speaking all these different languages. And the people all came together. Some people making fun of them. Some people are going, I've never seen anything like this. But what, what applications can we make? Well, let, let's understand the role in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit deals with believers and unbelievers. Let's start with unbelievers for just a second. Think of with the unbelievers. He's convicting the world of three things. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Sin because they have not believed. Righteousness because he goes to be with the Father. Judgment because the Prince of the World has been judged. That's John 6, 16, 7 through 11. He convicts the world, the unbeliever, that they've not trusted in Jesus Christ. Stay on that issue. Stay on that issue that it's faith alone in Christ alone. What about for believers? What does he do for us? Well, he, he regenerates us. He comes to live inside of us. He places us in Christ. He gives us spiritual gifts. He seals us. It, we, it, all of that happens the moment we believe. Now listen, you're born again, so live like a new person. You're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, so God lives in you. You've been placed in Christ. You're the body of Christ. You've been gifted with spiritual gifts. Use those gifts. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about whether you're going to be saved or not. You're already saved, and you're saved forever. As far as the Christian life is concerned, we're, you know, he, he fills us and he teaches us. So live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's live our lives. Listen, apart from him, you can do what? Nothing. In Christ, you can do all things. You cannot serve God unless it's God's power through you. The Holy Spirit is more than just a power. 
He is a person who lives in you. He is a comforter to console you, a counselor to advise you, an advocate to defend you, an intercessor to pray for you, and a guide to direct you. Second application. Let's fulfill our role as the church, the body of Christ. On the beginning of the church, the moment it was formed, they stepped out and proclaimed the message of Christ. What are we supposed to do? Now, we, we could look at it this way. We could say, well, we're a new local church. I mean, how long have we been in existence? A little, about seven months? Okay, we're new. The church, the body of Christ is not new, but we as a local church are new. We've all come together. We're in, we're in the body of Christ. We're in this local body. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to proclaim in this community the good news message of Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that last week that Brian, when he prayed, he prayed that Gene and I would have an opportunity to share our faith as we flew back from Colorado Springs. Is that right? Did he pray that? Guess what? When we got on the plane, I'm here, and a guy's sitting by me, and Jean is not by me. She's across the aisle, and there's a person sitting by her. And by the grace of God, I shared with this person about Jesus Christ, and she shared with this person about Jesus Christ. So the prayers are answered. Now let me tell you something. What, what are we supposed to do? Look for the opportunities. P- write down people's names that you come in contact with and you say, I don't know if this person's a Christian. I'm going to pray that God will give me an opportunity to share my faith. And when we walk out these doors, we're going out into a, into a world that's going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and we take the message so that people can put their faith in Christ and have eternal life. Wow. So may we understand the role of the Holy Spirit and may we fulfill our role as a local body touching lives for Christ beginning in this community and going throughout the world. Now something you may say going throughout the world. You understand that the video that they're doing right there goes throughout the world? There are places in Slovenia There are places in Africa. There are places in Indonesia that watch this video every week. Our message can go throughout the world, but it starts right 